Welcome back to the New World Podcast. I'm your host, Aris Kaki. And I'm your host, Akhil Samji. Today's guest is going to be a good one. Yaron Brook is the head of the Ayn Rand Institute, the world's leading objectivist philosopher and the host of the Yaron Brook Show, which you can catch on YouTube. The link will be placed in the description. He is also the author of many books, most notably Free Market Revolution and Equal is Unfair. Yaron spent his early years growing up in Israel and was a believer in many left-wing principles until he was introduced to the philosophy of objectivism. Since then, Yaron is passionate about growing the objectivist movement from an academic philosophy to a more mainstream ideology. With that all said and done, we would like to welcome to the show, Mr. Yaron Brook. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you for having me on. But I do want to make a, 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 a correction to the bio. I, I'm not a philosopher. And I'm certainly not the leading philosopher of objectivism. That's Lena Peikoff, and there are lots of other philosophers who are much more knowledgeable uh, about the philosophy, qua philosophy, than I am. So, um, I, you know, I'm good at, uh, you know, my strength is the application of these ideas to, to, to people's lives and to, to the world in which we live. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a finance guy. Mm, right? Yes, finance background, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, to us as a PR, <laughs> as a PR lead. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we'll just start get ready with the questions. Perfect. Sure. Yeah. Sure. sure. Cool. So, uh, Yaron, before we jump into uh, talking about Ayn Rand and objectivism, I wanted to uh, ask you in particular about maybe framing some historical context for our Gen Z listeners. Um, the society which we live in today, not necessarily uh, some of the more modern problems, but the way our systems have been built. Uh, could you relate that back to the Enlightenment? Maybe just talk to us about certain values, key values of the Enlightenment period. Um, why they matter, why was this so significant, and why I think for at least my high school or academic circles in terms of where I've studied history or philosophy, I've never even been taught in Canada, at least about the Enlightenment, although I've done, I've heard of John Locke, but I've never, I didn't know that this was an entire gathering of some of the most intellectual minds at the time where they came together, they concluded certain rational beliefs and solidified these beliefs as being the leading way to live your life. Uh, could you talk to us about why it took place and where it took place in particular and how that historical context has meaning to us today? Sure. I mean, I think it's a real crime the way history is taught today. Uh, it is it is truly tragic that uh, Gen X, Gen Zs, I guess you are, uh, don't really know kind of the, the, the historical causality, the, the, the path in which humanity has really taken. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of the astounding facts is that for tens of thousands of years, if that's even imaginable, that kind of scale, you know, humanity pretty much was in a state of uh, static existence. Uh, most human beings on planet Earth were subsistence farmers. They uh, they got up in the morning when the sun rose. They went out into the fields. They worked physical labor all day. They came back. They ate something, and they went to sleep because there was no light. As soon as it got dark, life was over. Uh, and and we romanticize that today, and the movies romanticize it, and and I think. Some literature romanticize it, but life was short. Life expectancy before 1800 was under 40, 39. I would be long dead. You guys would be approaching middle age, I guess. And um, it was brutish and it was really horrific. Uh, violence was everywhere. People were murdered. Uh, there were wars constantly. People were, were being killed and slaughtered. And this is the history of the human race. This is forever with a few exceptions, maybe Greece, Rome, uh, and, and, and certainly civilizations in some other places around the world, but those didn't last for very long. And almost none of them had what we take for granted, running water, electricity, just basic, basic things that we all today take for granted. So we are today like a million times richer in terms of the quality and standard of living that we have today, uh, richer than our ancestors than, than people were three, four, five hundred years ago, never mind 10,000 years ago. And, and why is that? What happened in the last 250 years that made us so much more comfortable, rich, easier to live, and of course has doubled and more life expectancy. I mean, life expectancy in Canada and the United States is over 80. Uh, child mortality is, you know, as close to zero as one can imagine. It used to be 50% of children didn't make age 10. 50% of kids died before the age of 10. I mean, that's unimaginable today to a modern Western audience. 
So uh, really, uh, you know, if you look at Western history, uh, the cause of, uh, of this amazing progress has its roots in, in ancient Greece, in uh, the ideas of the Greeks, in the fact that they cherished human life and they started thinking about the issues of the world. They started thinking about what we know, how we know it, why, why we know something, what is the good life, what is not good life, what is moral, what is not moral. And they started, they created a field called philosophy. And, and really it's the ideas of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle that really shaped the world uh, ever since. Many of those ideas, certainly the better of those ideas, the Aristotelian ideas were lost during the uh, rise of Christianity, the destruction of Rome, and then the dark ages. And they were slowly rediscovered by the Catholic Church, uh, culminating with uh, Thomas Aquinas, who really brought them into the church and made them a reality. And over many decades and centuries following that, these ideas kind of infiltrated Western culture and, and became more established. But at the same time, religion was a big factor. And uh, during the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, there were massive wars. I mean, on a scale that we can't even imagine today. Uh, you know, as a percentage of the population, more people died in the wars of the 16th century than died in the 20th century, even though we had a first or second world war during that period. I mean, and, and the wars were all religious wars, Protestants and Catholics killing each other on, on a massive scale. Uh, and at the same time, you've got these philosophical ideas bubbling under the surface. And, and in the 17th century, what re- in the 18th century, what really happens is people are sick of the wars people come to realize that these religious wars are are, are destructive and horrific and and a disaster. And these philosophical ideas are starting to bubble up. And and the way they really break through is with the scientific revolution. If you think about the Enlightenment, the first Enlightenment thinker is really Newton, right? Newton's laws, the real first scientist who really... Uh, it try, explains the world that we see, that we observe in ways that people can understand and becomes very popular. These ideas spread through Europe very quickly. And with that, people start saying to themselves, if you will, huh, I can understand the physical world. I can understand how objects move. I can understand these things. I used to believe, everybody used to tell me the truth was in a book written 2,000 years ago, written by God or whatever, right? And that the only way I could know the truth is through, you know, the, the, the experts, the prophets, the Pope, the, the Platonic philosopher kings. But it turns out I can know truth using my own senses and my own mind. And they started questioning as a consequence of that, they, you know, this discovery of reason as efficacious, reason as a source of knowledge. They suddenly started questioning everything. And you had John Locke asking these kind of questions. Well, if people, if people, uh, if we can understand the physical world using reason, why can't we understand what's right and wrong using reason? Why can't we decide on a political system using reason? Why can't we decide on who a political leader should be using reason? And, and people started questioning, why can't I decide my profession using reason? Before the Enlightenment, you did what your father did. If you were a man and if you were a woman, you had babies, you hope not to die at childbirth and you managed the home. That's it. There was no other options. Uh, but but men did what their fathers did. There was a guilt system and, and that was it. So suddenly people started questioning these and suddenly you got the birth of this idea that the individual matters, that your life is an end in itself, that you have rights. This is John Locke's great contribution that you have rights. All of that politically gets codified in the founding of America, in the Declaration of Independence, and then a constitution. Uh, Suddenly you get entrepreneurs, you get people saying, hey, I've got ideas. I've got an idea how to take the science and turn it into a product. And I don't need permission of a king. I don't need the permission of a pope. I can just do it. So you get the Industrial Revolution. Uh, You get a continuation of the scientific revolution into the 19th century, where people are continuously asking themselves and pushing the envelope, and you get these massive advances in science in the 18th and 19th and into the 20th century. So the alignment is when all this happens. It's when this Aristotelian idea of reason 
of individualism, of human happiness, the importance of human happiness, all become a reality for a vast number of people. They take it seriously and they start applying it to their lives and they change the world. And the world we live in today, the good parts of it are all products of the enlightenment. The bad parts of it are all products of reactionary forces continuously fighting against the enlightenment. But that's the battle that we live today in. It's enlightenment versus everybody who's aligned against it. Mm -hmm. Great you. And uh, that was a great like answer. You basically summed up my history class in like five minutes. Well, I, it would be great <laughs> if you had that class. I, I wish yeah. you had it. But, yeah. uh, you know, this is it would be great if we actually went to school and studied this in detail and actually studied each period. And, and from the perspective of what caused the good stuff and what caused the bad stuff and what are these clashes of ideas and philosophies and, 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 and how did how did these shape the events that happened? Because. I believe, Ayn Rand believe, I learned this from Ayn Rand and Leonard Peikoff, that ideas shape history. They shape the future. They shape human events. They shape your life as an individual, and they shape our lives as a culture and as a, it is, as a, it is a historical phenomenon. Yeah, and, uh, you know, now we want to move on to the main topic. Sure. Uh, but just, I just wanted to give a comment. You know, honestly speaking, I never even heard of Ayn Rand or yourself or even the uh, philosophy of objectivism until I started prepping for this interview. And, uh, you know, doing a Google search only yields like biased and inaccurate data of different things. And even too, I feel our listeners probably have, don't even know who Ayn Rand is considering they were born way past her timeline. And the most significant history event was either the 2008 Great Recession or 9-11. And so, you know, as the head of the Ayn Rand Institute, I'm pretty sure you know a lot about Ayn Rand, her life, her philosophies. Yep. So could you tell our listeners who was Ayn Rand? So I, I do, I need to make one more correction in my bio. Mm -hmm. I'm not technically the head of the Ayn Rand Institute in terms of CEO. I was mm -hmm. for 17 years. Mm -hmm. I'm now the chairman of the board. Oh. So, uh, you know, Tal Tzfani is the, is the CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute. But uh, so just with that, I don't want to get into trouble. So just put that caveat. <laughs> um Sure. I mean, Ayn Rand was a was a, a, a writer, a novelist, and a uh, and a philosopher. Mm -hmm. And uh, for most uh, Gen Zers, but really for anybody, uh, the thing you want to really read if, is is the Fountainhead mm -hmm. and Atlas Shrugged. Uh, you know, hopefully some of your viewers have, will have read the books because the books are out there. Mm -hmm. They're in the culture. They're part of the culture. And and even some in some schools particularly in the United States, at least. I'm not sure how much in Canada, but also in Canada, from at least during my years as, as head of the Ayn Rand Institute, it was certainly the case in Canada. Uh, Fountainhead and Anthem and Atlas Shrugged were books being read in high schools in Canada. We get a lot of uh, uh, Canadian kids writing into our high school essay contests. Uh, we did that in, in the U.S. and U.K., in a lot of English speaking countries, even even in non English speaking countries, we we the largest we have the largest high school essay contest in the world. Uh, we get thousands and thousands of essays, uh, and that's how partially how we keep Ayn Rand alive in, in for the younger generations. You know, people go online and look for scholarships, yeah. <laughs> and, and they find they find the essay contest and they apply. And a lot of people have won a lot of money from us. So Ayn Rand was a novelist, uh, primarily, and, and a philosopher. She was born in 1905 in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, she was born to a, uh, a, her father was a pharmacist. He owned a pharmacy at the, at the bottom of the building in which they lived. Uh, he, so he had a, a, a reasonable, a nice business, a, a reasonable income. And then, of course, uh, in 1914, you had the Russian Revolution. You had the rise of communism. Uh, literally, the square where this revolution starts is in St. Petersburg, right outside of the pharmacy, right outside of their home. She witnessed it. So she lived through the Civil War in Russia during the revolution. Um, and, uh, and, of course, when the revolution was won by the communists, uh, the pharmacy was taken away, nationalized. Uh, their apartment was taken away. They had to share it with other families. So she witnessed, uh, was a real witness to life under communism and what that meant uh, as a teenager. Uh, she, she went to university, but it was quite clear that she stayed in the, in the, in the Soviet Union. They would kill her. I mean, she was an independent thinker from, the, from very young. 
Uh, and she, she could not hold her tongue. I mean, she, she expressed her views and she was going to get into trouble and there's no question about that. So uh, in a small window of opportunity in the 1920s, when Lenin allowed people to leave in the late 1920s for study abroad type things, she managed to get a visa to the United States to come and research film. She was studying film. Um, and she got, she had a cousin in the U S who owned a movie theater in Chicago and he wrote a letter and she got out. Her family knew she would never come back. So she got on a train left they, they knew they would never see her again. Um, and she came to the United States, came to Chicago with nothing. Um, then went uh, to Hollywood because her dream was to be a writer and, uh, and she loved movies. So she wanted to be a screenwriter. She wanted to write for the movies. Uh, and on her first day in Hollywood, true story. She, she goes to Cesar B. DeMille Studios. And you guys probably don't know who Cesar B. DeMille was, but <laughs> one of the great pioneers of the movie industry and, and one of the most famous directors in, in movie history. And she goes to the studio and, uh, you know, she has a letter of introduction. They say, you know, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> and uh, she walks out of the studio and this Cesar B. DeMille driving by in this massive convertible. Um, and this is, you know, the late 1920s. And, and she stares at him. She's this little Russian girl. She stares at him. And he, and he stops the car and he says, you know, why are you staring at me? What, you know, what, what's, what are you doing here? And she tells him, you know, I'm from Russia. And she has this thick Russian accent. And I, I want to get into the movies. I, I, want to, I want to learn everything there is about the industry. I want to write for the movies. And he says, okay, well, get in the car. I'll, I'll, let, me, let me show you. So he takes her. Uh, to where they're filming the King of Kings is is a movie silent movie about Jesus Christ, right? And he and he he says here's a week pass to the lot so you can learn about the movie. So she becomes an extra on the movie, <laughs> and for years she has all kinds of end, odds and ends jobs uh, in the movie business uh, trying to learn. And ultimately, she writes scripts, she gets movies made, she she reviews scripts, uh, so she becomes part of the industry. Uh, she also writes plays, and some of them are ultimately performed on Broadway and in L.A. She writes her first novel, We the Living, which is a, as close to an autobiographical novel that she ever wrote. It's about growing up in a communism in the Soviet Union and what life is like. It's a powerful novel. Uh, I recommend it to everybody. It's a fairly easy read, and, and, and it's beautiful, and it's, it's heart-wrenching because of you see what communism really is about. Uh, the, she then writes a, a little novelletta called, a novella called Anthem, which is published in the UK first and only then in the United States, a, a dystopian type novella. Uh, it would take you about a couple of hours to read, definitely worth reading, it's very short, but again, very powerful. And here you can already start seeing the themes. Individualism versus collectivism comes out of this. What is the purpose of life? Is it to live for others? or to live for yourself that comes out of this novella. Then uh, she writes a book called The Fountainhead, and The Fountainhead is um, rejected by 12 publishers. Wow. Wow. But when it comes out, finally, there's a publisher who brings it out, and they, they don't quite believe in it. They don't print a lot of copies, but it becomes a bestseller um, and uh, word of mouth, and they have to go back into the printing presses and reprint, and it's still a bestseller. It still sells. <laughs> Uh, tens of thousands and, and sometimes hundreds of thousands of copies of, a year um, uh, around the world. Today, it's been translated into almost every language out there. It's, it's, there are more copies of Fountainhead uh, that sell in other languages than in English. Oh, wow, okay. It's a huge international uh, bestseller. And, and I think if you want to understand, I mean, I think it's the American novel. I think it's the American novel. Forget Scott F. Fitzgerald. Yeah. That's, <laughs> you know, it doesn't come close. The Fountainhead represents America in its, in its deepest sense and what it means and what America represents. And then uh, after The Fountainhead, she wrote her, what, what, what is a magnus opus, Atlas Shrugged. Um, it took her 12 years to write. By the time she published this, every publisher wanted it. Mm -hmm. uh, they had, they, you know, they, they bid for it. Uh, and uh, when it came out, it was an instant bestseller. And again, it sells hundreds of thousands of copies, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of copies every single year in every language out there. Uh, and it's, it's, everybody should read Atlas Shrugged. It's a, it's a, it's a profound book uh, where she really summarizes her entire philosophy. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of her life. So this was 50, uh, 
uh, Fountainhead was published in 45. Uh, Atlas Shrugged was published in 1957. I know ancient history for you guys. Yeah. And then she spent the 60s and 70s really writing philosophical commentary on the culture. Uh, real philo philosophical, uh, uh, you know, original work. But then a lot of what she wrote was commentary on the culture and what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, she died in 1982. Um, and uh, the Ironman Institute was founded in 1985 uh, to, get, to kind of continue uh, uh, promoting her work and make sure that her philosophy uh, stays uh, in the public eye and, and in, the, in the debate and in, in the discussion. And uh, it's still true that many young people read her book. Many young people are influenced by her. And now with the internet, it's, it's an opportunity to get these ideas to even a broader, bigger, bigger audience. Mm -hmm. So that's her. We can talk about her ideas if you like next. Yeah, sure. yeah, that was just my next question. I wanted to segue into objectivism and really what is that? So, I mean, the quick answer, I mean, there's a long answer and a short answer. The mm -hmm. long answer, you, you can take uh, hours and hours and hours and hours of seminars and lectures, and they're all up online, and you can go to something called Ayn Rand University. There's an app. You can download it. Wow. And there is, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of hours of uh, content on mm -hmm. objectivism, on what the philosophy is as a philosophy. The short version is that, in metaphysics, metaphysics is the science of what is. It's mm -hmm. the study of what is. Ayn Rand held that reality is what it is. It sounds obvious, but a lot of philosophers uh, think that reality is, in a sense, a creation of our own consciousness. Mm -hmm. okay. We, you know, we, it, or it's a creation of somebody else's consciousness, God or whatever, right? But for Rand, reality is what it is. A is A, to quote Aristotle. The law of identity holds, the law of causality holds. Things act according to their own identity, and the identity uh, is firm. Um, and that, uh, you know, so that's metaphysics. In epistemology, the study of knowledge, she held that reality is knowable. Mm -hmm. It's knowable through reason, through our senses and through our reasoning faculty, our, our faculty of reason. Um, it's not knowable through your emotions, mm -hmm. it's not knowable through revelation. And it's not, as modern philosophy would teach us, unknowable, right? Mm -hmm. Most modern philosophers believe oh, we don't know what reality really is. Mm -hmm. We just know what we pretend reality is or we make up reality. Or and so she was a huge advocate of reason, right? Of, 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 the, of the ability of human beings to understand, know reality, abstract from it, create, you know, form concepts from it, and ultimately manipulate nature for our own means. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the question is, who reasons? Just like we don't have a collective stomach, so nobody else can eat for you, we don't have a collective brain. There's no collective consciousness. Nobody can eat for you, and it's also true that nobody can think for you. You have to do your own thinking. Indeed, she argued that their life depends on you doing your own thinking. So for Rand, the individual is the unit that matters because it is the unit that thinks. It is the unit that's alive. And so her morality, her ethical code is an ethics of, uh, it's an ethics of egoism. It's an ethics of self-interest. The purpose of your life is your life. Mm -hmm. It's your flourishing. It's your survival. It's ultimately your happiness. Indeed, your moral purpose of your life is your own happiness. To contrast with the common view, which the ethical purpose of your life is to sacrifice for others, particularly if they're needy, particularly if they're weak, uh, so everybody else is important. You're not. For Rand, you're important. Your relationship with everybody else is dictated by you, mm -hmm. by your life, by your values. Other people are value because they contribute to your life. Um, so she was not a believer in sacrificing to others, but she was also not a believer in sacrificing other people to you. Every individual is an end in himself. Every individual is striving to happiness. Sacrifice is not appropriate in terms of human interaction. The way human beings should interact is through the process of trade, where the spiritual or material. And then the question is, okay, the next kind of issue in philosophy is politics. Well, if the purpose of your life is your happiness, what political system is most appropriate? 
for individuals seeking their happiness? Well, here you have to answer the question, well, how do you seek your happiness? The appropriate way for human beings to seek happiness is by using their mind, by using their reason. It is their means of survival. It is their faculty of knowing the world. Every value that we have is a product of human reason. Somebody is reasoning. Somebody is thinking. Everything we have around us, somebody thought and produced. Mm. So what is the enemy of, of reasoning, of thinking, of using your mind? Well, force, coercion, mm -hmm. authority. So how do we create a political system where we don't have force, coercion, authority? That's, we have to have the concept of individual rights, which basically bridges morality to politics. So basically says, your life is yours. You have the freedom to pursue the values that you deem necessary for your survival, rationally, using reason. <laughs> Nobody can use force against you. That's the meaning of rights. The right to life is the right to pursue your values, free of coercion. <laughs> and of course, the political system that institutionalizes individual rights is capitalism. The <laughs> system in which the government's only job is the protection of individual rights. So she rejects socialism or any kind of statism where the state is more important than the individual, where the state imposes its will on the individual. So fascism, the mixed economy, statism, the world as we have today, all those political systems she rejects. She believes in a pure form of capitalism, the only kind of form of capitalism, capitalism, where the only role of government is to protect your rights and your life. And on top of that, she also has a theory of aesthetics, of art, why it's important for your life, why art is crucial, why you shouldn't live without art, and what is good art, what is bad art, what and what, how does art fulfill a need. Uh, but, but in that sense, she's one of the few philosophers in human history that has a view on all the key questions in philosophy. She's a system builder. She's not just a like Locke, who's primarily a political philosopher. Uh, but she is. She has a view and an original view and a new view on pretty much every key question the philosophers have been asking for the last three thousand years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to um, quickly pause and just take a detour because I know you mentioned uh, an idea right now. Where you said the the famous word socialism, which has been kind of in the news recently, um, as we see down south of the border. But um, I want to reflect because I think sometimes we misunderstand history. And by misunderstanding history, it's often that, um, I believe it was Plato that said those who control stories control society, the idea that like you have to be a good storyteller, or the idea that stories um, are the ones that control the narrative by which we function in everyday life. So I know that collectively, we all agreed in school, or I guess if you don't, then maybe you're part of a very marginal case, but we agreed that the, after the events of 1945, uh, we understood that Nazi Germany, like never again, we understood as a collective, as, as a consensus of the world, after we saw those photographs of the concentration camps, that never again, this will never happen again. But it seems as though, even though it's been like 30, almost three decades since the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall, and how we've understood that sort of like communism is on like the ash heaps of history, there is still this flirtation with the bigger umbrella term of socialism. The idea that um, well, pure capitalism in its uh, in its innate um, form is, un as you mentioned, the, the, from the altruistic perspective, oh, it's unequal. Therefore, it causes division from an elite to a right bourgeoisie to proletariat. Do you what, do you see? Uh, I know you've mentioned in previous podcasts and appearances. Uh, can you describe the similarities? Because I think you've juxtaposed both Nazism and communism in the same way, in the sense that you would. I, I, I presume and I, I believe the same way, particularly from our family history, considering that our parents came from a part of Africa whereby uh, socialism was rampant. However, it wasn't branded as Marxism. Like, oh, we're not the Marxist guys. We're, 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 we're socialists, but we like an African sense. Like uh, this, this idea of why it's still there and particularly in Western circles. Yeah, I mean, there's no question. For example, the communism and Nazism are the same. There's no fundamental difference. There's certainly no difference in morality. They're both evil ideologies, evil ideologies that lead to death and destruction on a massive scale. Indeed, communism has killed more people than fascism uh, in its history. But socialism, which is just kind of a toned down, moderate version of communism, it has, and, and indeed communism itself, 
all have much better public relations than fascism, right? Nobody wants to be a Nazi. Nobody wants, nobody wants to associate with Nazis. Nobody, everybody walks out of a room if a Nazi walks in. But if somebody walks into a room and said, I'm a communist, everybody goes, oh, hi, you know, that's kind of interesting. And the reason is that socialism and Nazi, socialism and, and, and communism are very consistent with the prevailing moral code. And the prevailing moral code is a morality of, uh, of altruism, of sacrifice, of self-sacrifice, of collectivism, but a kind of collectivism that's different than the fascist collectivism and more similar than the communist collectivism. The thing that people hate about the fascist collectivism is not the collectivism. What they hate about it is that it was racist. What they hate about it is that it established some people as supposed to be better genetically than other people. That's what they hate about it. The collectivism in and of itself, they don't mind. They, they hate, they, 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 they share the anti-individualism of the fascists. They just don't like the that some groups are better than others. Now, in a sense, that exists in communism too. Because if you real, if you read Karl Marx, uh, the 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 proletarian get rid of all the other classes, and even some peoples who are not who don't fit are not fit to be proletarian. You get rid of. So, communism has built into it the same kind of the same kind of conflict. As, as, as Nazism and fascism does, but people ignore that. Uh, people view communism and socialism as egalitarian. Egalitarian is treating everybody the same based on race and other issues and ultimately leading to some kind of equality of outcome or equality of opportunity and a reduction in inequality of outcome. But they all disregard the individual. They're all anti-individualist. What matters is the group. What matters is society. What matters is... Uh, the, 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 whatever, however you want to create this association, this group that you created, whether it's the proletarian, whether it's society, whether it's your country, whatever it happens to be, they are all should be equal. Um, and the job of the individual in such a society is to sacrifice for the sake of the collective. Now, if you think about it, that's consistent with Christianity. It's consistent with almost every moral code that exists in the West. There's no opposition to that idea. Nobody stands up and says, no, we don't think that's right, that's just, that's moral. People might say, we don't think that works. We think you'll all be poor. Uh, you think it, has, it hasn't worked in history. Mm -hmm. But nobody says, the, and, and you, the idea is immoral. The idea is evil. Uh, indeed, you see the opposite. You see a lot of conservatives, a lot of people on the right say, you know, even, even Jordan Peterson, right? University of Toronto, you mentioned, so Jordan Peterson says things like, no, no, you know, socialism and communism, wonderful ideas, beautiful ideas, just not practical. People want to be inspired. People want to have an ideal. So they're much more interested in the ideal than in the practicality. And that's why generation after generation, young people who are idealistic, who want to believe in something, become socialists because it's all that's presented to them. Mm -hmm. And people, the people who oppose socialism, what they need to do is rally around an alternative ideal. I believe that ideal is individualism. That ideal is objectivism. That ideal is an ideal of individual happiness. Uh, the ideal is, is, is making the most of your life, living a great life, living a fantastic life. But for whatever reason, because of education and because of religion and because of everything else, we're conditioned to be in a group. We're conditioned to be in a collective. And, and most people are much more attracted, unfortunately, to the ideal of, of collectivism and therefore socialism than they are to the ideal of individualism and therefore capitalism. But, and, and, and they, uh, as you said, a lot of people have never heard of it, right? Because who stood for the ideal of individualism and a morality of individualism? Ayn Rand and pretty much nobody else. Almost, yeah, for sure. Uh, I want to segue quickly in, uh, into capitalism, but also I want to relate what you just mentioned uh, with regards to this uh, ideal of young people being idealistic. Um, as someone who's during this whole uh, crisis that we've been in, kind of taken his uh, taken an interest in how the modern shaped world is today. I can think back to studying counterculture in the 60s and how much of a role 
it, it, today's progressive. So, for example, people that espouse certain similar things that you're mentioning, like, like I think of like AOC, um, I think of left leaning parties here in Canada, like the NDP. Um, these these ideas in the whether they were formed in the ac academy in the university systems, how much did the sixties and counterculture have to do with it? Was this was it um, which I'm I'm sort of on the edge of uh, in terms of my observation and my hypothesis after studying this, but is it the collapse of the importance of the church and the importance of the religious institutions in the sixties kind of that people young people began to look towards idealistic uh, they, they looked for somewhere else for that ideal and so they thought that the Marxist or the collective principles of me fighting for something greater than myself in the same realm of the, of the Christian Judeo Christian value system. Do you think that contributed? And then the mark, the university professors were just like pumping oil on the, on the fire basically. Well, I, I think all of that is true, but I think that the, the issue really is that the 1960s were a, a new phenomena the, the what Ayn Rand called it, the new left. And you're seeing that today, but that the shift was happening for decades before that. So the the shift away from capitalism really started in the in the eighteen eighties and nineties with the progressive movement, mm -hmm. and the progressive movement was already taking Marx's ideas, taking Hegel's ideas, undermining American individualism, bringing out the ideas of collectivism. But they still had this respect for ideas, respect for reason, respect for science. Uh, they were they were Marxists, much more fundamentally Marxists, uh, but they was clearly undercutting American capitalism. And and of course, American capitalism didn't die ten years ago. It didn't die in the financial crisis. American capitalism died in eighteen ninety when antitrust laws were passed for the first time, and and in the you know in ni uh, nineteen teens, nineteen fourteen, when income tax and and the Federal Reserve was established in the nineteen thirties with the Great New Deal. So with the New Deal, so the, the capitalism has been dying, being murdered really slowly for a long, long time. But what happened in the 1960s is a new generation came about who was reading the existentialist, who was reading the postmodernist, who was, was writing their own ideas. And they were now rejecting what's called the old left. They rejected Marx to a large extent. They rejected the old philosophers. They, they didn't know they were channeling them in some ways, but they reject. Their view is reason is impotent. Science is impotent. Remember, Marx argues for scientific socialism. The 60s are anti-scientific socialism, right? They don't want science in socialism. They just want their feelings. Go to Woodstock. It's not about Marx. Mm -hmm. It's about hedonism. Emotion, self-expression without a self, if you will, right? Yeah. Um, so they want a kind of collectivism that's tribal and emotionalist and postmodern. Mm -hmm. So what you see from the 60s to today is the intellectual. And so their professors were these Marxists who were trying to tell them, oh, you know, no, no, no. We still need the structure. We still need reason. We still need thought. We still need ideas. We still need evidence. And these kids are saying, no, we don't need any of that. We just need our emotions. We just said, you know, reality is meaningless. Reality is unknowable. We, it's all in our head. Uh, you're determined by your race. You're determined by your genes, whatever. It, all of this is nonsense. So, so that, And then they become the professors. So what you get over the last 40 years is that the new left, the 60s counter-revolution, are the dominant intellectuals in our culture. And what are they teaching? They're teaching critical race theory, which says that you're determined by your race and it's inherent in you. And therefore, as a white person, you should feel guilty. As a black person, you should feel uh, a victim as a victim. And, 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 and you know, uh, and, and as a brown person, I get somewhere in the middle. And, and there's this whole, you get a whole categorization of, of, uh, uh, of victimhood, right? Uh, which is this... Uh, uh, what do they call it now? Uh, you know, you know, they have this whole hierarchies of who's bigger victim and the oppression it's, hierarchy. What's that? The oppression, the oppression hierarchy. hierarchy. Uh, there's a term which has just slipped through my mind, but um, intersectionality, right? The whole intersectionality right. movement is about this hierarchy of oppression, mm -hmm. and it has to do with your sexuality, and it has to do with your. They've discovered 92 sexes, and and it has to do with your your race, and they've discovered lots of different races, and 
And all of this is completely devout of science. It's completely, I mean, Marx would be shocked by it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, economics, which is Marx's hallmark, right? Economic class is only one of the many, many, many categories of oppression. And what they have done is they, they've completely made emotions as, a, as, as the most important thing in the world. That's why they view speech as violence, because if you offend them, you hurt your emotions. That's like them being punched in the nose. They don't see a difference in that. And they have destroyed, they are the anti-enlightenment forces today. Now, I think they're pretty impotent because they don't have a theory. They don't have anything to stand on. They don't really have ideas. Their ideas are meaningless because at the end, it's all grounded in emotion. But they dominate the intellectual world today. And you hear their voices constantly. And this is what people like Jordan Peterson are speaking up against. But again, the challenge there is, you know, do you have a do you have a set of ideas to replace this? And that's where Peterson and others, I think, fail. They don't have something coherent, idealistic to replace these what, what these intellectuals. And note, these intellectuals are not idealists. What's the idealism of critical race theory? It's not colorblindness. They don't believe in colorblindness. That was Martin Luther King. That's the old left. The new left doesn't believe in colorblindness. They want us all to be color, you know, conscious, right? Constantly think about color. Uh, is it socialism? Is it some socialist utopia? Not really. The, the, the postmodernist critical race theory people, are, they just want control. It's not about even socialism. It's about control. They want to run your life. They want to run your life based on some ridiculous hierarchy. But their system falls apart. There's no coherent ideology. Even AOC and to some extent Bernie Sanders are still to some extent remnants of the old left. They still believe in socialism, right? But the real, the, the, the people behind BLM, uh, Antifa, people like that, they don't believe in socialism. They believe in mayhem. They believe in destruction. They believe in hate. They believe in nothing. Uh, Ayn Rand called it, what they really worship is the zero, is nothingness. Um, and it's true that religion plays some role in here in two ways. One, the rejection of religion and the idea of what now, where the values come from. But also, I would argue, and Ayn Rand would argue, that religion conditions them towards emotionalism. Because what is religion? How do we know God exists? Because we feel it. There, there is no logical explanation. There's no rational explanation. So what, what religion conditions people is to feel, to have faith, to believe in revelation, and to be collectivist. And then these intellectuals capitalize on the fact that these kids are being raised religious to move them towards this nihilistic you know, uh, uh, anarchistic he is a, a point of view, but it's, they're not even fighting for an ideal anymore. There's some socialists out there who believe in something, but, but the people in the streets, they don't believe in anything other than hatred. And, you know, I just wanted to go back towards objectivism. I know you were talking a little bit about altruism and you were kind of referring to the hierarchy of values. I kind of wanted to touch base on that and just hope you could explain it. So altruism says that your top value mm -hmm. is other people. That your purpose in life is to sacrifice other people. Their well-being, other people's well-being is what's important. So, I mean, Augustine Comte, the French uh, 19th century philosopher, basically said, if you help somebody else, and while helping them, you think, oh, I'm going to do this because it's going to make me happy. Doesn't count. Yeah. Because you thought about yourself. Mm -hmm. So, Altruism is about sacrifice. What is sacrifice? Sacrifice means giving up something and not expecting anything in return, spiritual or material. Or it means being worse off after what you did. That's the sign of nobility. Think Jesus on a cross. He's not better off after he's just been brutally murdered. He's dead. But he's a saint. He's uh, what Jordan Peterson calls a superhero. He 
suffered not for his sins, but for our sins. Now, I would say that's an enormous injustice. You should suffer for your sins. I don't want to suffer for your sins. Mm -hmm. You sinned, you should suffer. So altruism basically conditions people to sacrifice and suffer. Most people don't want to be altruistic, Mm -hmm. but they don't know there's an option. So they cheat. They live most of their lives in pursuit of, you know, wealth and happiness and good feeling good about themselves and so on. But in the back of their mind, they know that to really be a saint, to really be good with a capital G, they should be Mother Teresa. They should sacrifice. They should give up everything. Mm. So what do you feel when you know you should do X and you actually do Y? Mm-hmm. You feel guilt. So we live in a society filled with guilt. And of course, politicians and intellectuals use that against us. So we feel guilty about the poor. So they say, look, We'll, 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 we'll allow you to, to not feel so guilty about the poor by allowing us to raise your taxes and we'll take care of the poor. Yeah. And yeah. people vote. Yeah, okay, raise my taxes, no problem. Mm-hmm. So I can feel less guilty. Yeah. Right? Okay. Objectivism says that's all nonsense. That's all doesn't make any sense. The fundamental is your life. And the fundamental choice that you have to make in life is whether you want to live or not. But once you've made that choice, and 99% of us, 99.99% of us make the choice to live, then the question morality needs it, it needs to answer, the reason we need morality, is, well, how should I live? What should I do? And because we're not animals like all others, in the sense that we have free will, we have to choose our values. A lion doesn't decide what values to pursue. Mm-hmm. It just does what it's programmed to do. Mm-hmm. You as a human being can choose what values to pursue, what ideas to believe in, how, what kind of life to live. So Rand believes that your, the purpose of morality is to teach us how to live a good life, a life appropriate to a reasoning being, to a being with a reasoning mind to a thinking animal, to a rational animal. So reason is obviously big in Ayn Rand's ethics. It's the core principle around ethics. If one principle uh, by which to live based on objectivism is think. So at the top of the hierarchy is think. Think for yourself. Figure out what's good for you. Mm -hmm. You don't know automatically. Your emotions won't necessarily tell you what's good for you. You have to figure it out and you have to devote significantly resources to figuring it out. So figure out what's good for you. Um, And then once you figure out what's good for you, then figure out, okay, life is complex. There's a lot of things that are good for you that you want to do. What's most important? Mm -hmm. What are the things I should focus on? And that's going to change in life concretely right now for you guys. Going to university is most important. Mm -hmm. Later, it might be career. It might be finding a, you know, a, 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 somebody to, to share your life with for the rest of your life. They, they, you know, so you create a hierarchy of values of what's most important to me, what are the other things, and at the top should be your moral values, mm-hmm. things like to think, be independent, be honest. Then oh, I need to go to school, I need to have a career, I need to do all these other things. And you know, somewhere at the bottom, there might be, I want a nice house, I, might, I want some material goods. But all of this needs to be in a hierarchy. See, when you go and decide... What am I going to do tomorrow? Mm-hmm. You know, well, this is the most important thing. And I'm not going to give this up for something down here. That would be a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. I'm going to live my life pursuing the things that are most important to me. That, that's a really mind-blowing way to think, uh, to think about life. You know? Yes, and sadly, very few people live this way. Mm-hmm. And it's sad because it means that very few people are living a fully expressed, fully utilizing the time they have on this earth, you know, fully embracing their lives, maximizing their potential as living beings. And it's, it's sad to contemplate all the wasted life mm-hmm. out there. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, you were talking about free will and I wanted to touch upon that. Uh, why do you think free will and reason are more supreme than willful blindness and letting others rule you? I, I know you kind of touched upon that, but like, if you could explain a little more. Well, you know, wolf and blindness, just try crossing the street. Mm-hmm. I mean, 
you can be blind and you can walk around pretending to be blind, but you're going to suffer the consequences. Mm -hmm. Reality doesn't care what you believe. Reality is what it is. That car is coming whether you believe it's coming or not. Mm -hmm. And if you're willfully blind, you'll get run over. Now, it won't always be so obvious as the car will run over. But, uh, you know, if, it might be that you take drugs that do harm to your brain and therefore you won't be able to have a, a, a fulfilling life. It might be that you decide, I don't want to go to school. I'm going to party all the time. And by the time you realize that you, you don't, you know, you don't have where to feed yourself tomorrow and you're homeless on the street, that's willful blindness. Reality, the, ne the, the necessary things, values that you need in order to live, don't care about your ideas. Food, that your, your biology, the fact that you need food doesn't care about what you think about food. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and the same with other people doing your thinking for you. I mean, why? I mean, that's such a bizarre idea. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, I said it earlier, nobody can do the eating for me. Mm -hmm. Why would I want anybody to do thinking? Thinking is the most important thing you do in life. The only person I trust to do my thinking for me is me. Exactly. And, and if other people do my thinking, I'm nothing. I'm literally nothing. I've declared to the world and to myself that I am a nobody, I'm a zero, I'm a non-entity. Mm -hmm. And what's the point in living at that point? So both courses of action lead to complete and utter self-destruction. Right now, you mentioned that previously that we live in a mixed economy. Most of our countries that we do, whether it be Canada, yep. the United States in particular, um, which reminds me of another, uh, another concept that I want to bring up, which is, um, as a pure objectivist, um, what would be the role forward? Like, what would be like, I know you've mentioned and you've kind of avoided the, the use of the term, like of describing objectivism as a utopia, because that's basically exactly what Ayn Rand described as it not being in terms of a collective sort of hive mind sense. Yeah. Um, where would you see the objectivist, like where could the objectivist work from, from the mixed economy we have right now? Um, where would, it, let's say, for example, if you had, if you were advising the president of the United States right now, the president-elect, hopefully Joe Biden <laughs> listens to you, but, <laughs> but let's say, for example, he, he got, you have the paper and the pen and you had to like write everything down from the beginning in terms of whether it be, as you mentioned, the establishment of the federal reserve or uh, the mixed economy they're working on or the cronyism that takes place on wall street when it comes to some government doing insider trading yeah. with uh, insider inside favors with wall street. Where do you see the objectivist point of view that how do I tackle this problem first so I can return back to the ideal world that Ayn Rand was talking about? Yeah. So, so first, let me just say that you're asking about politics. You're asking about how do we impact the world to, and how would we impact the world to move? Yes. But first and most important thing you should do with these ideas is live, is, is improve your own life. Even in a mixed economy, we have enough choices and enough freedom to be able to live our lives. So first thing you do is live your life and make the most of your life. That's the most important thing. Now, politically, how do we move from where we are today to a mixed economy? Well, first, you have to convince people to a capitalist economy. You have to convince people that, that capitalism matters, that capitalism is what they want, because you can't force capitalism on people. It's a contradiction in terms. You can't force people to be free. So they have to want to be free. So the, the most important thing we as objectivists could do is educate, educate, educate. Mm -hmm. educate people about the value of capitalism, mm -hmm. value of individualism. And then in terms of how do you bring it about politically? Well, I mean, you've got to roll back the state in every aspect. You've got to get the state out of education, privatize the schools, and, and there are all kinds of ideas on how to do that so that poor people don't suffer too much and how you bridge the gap, how you, you know, move slowly towards a system of completely private schools. Get rid of government-run healthcare, certainly in Canada, but also in the United States. Get rid of, uh, you know, all the cronyism, all the things. So one of the things I would do very early on if I were president and if the people supported this, I would create a separation of state from economics. Okay. Just roll back all the ways in which the state is involved in economics the cronyism, the regulations, the controls, the subsidies, the taxes, get rid of those too. So that the state has no business in your business. Mm -hmm. Zero. That's the only way to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. Now that is going to take a long time. That's not easy to do tomorrow, but that's the 
that's the movement that has to happen. It has to happen towards more freedom. Limited government. Government limited to just protecting our rights and not interfering in how we live our lives. Um, I know you just mentioned something that we're both passionate about, which is the idea of, as we mentioned previously, we're hell-bent on stressing the idea of individuality, and particularly within Gen Z. Um, maybe it's just our inherent bias, but do you see a cultural shift? Maybe it might seem kind of pessimistic now, maybe if you're watching on mainstream media or social media, do you see a pendulum shift happening with Gen Z? I think we, I think we face it here on the ground because the, the reason is, for example, that um, as we mentioned, since the 60s, so the, the boomers, Gen X, the millennials, and then us. I remember talking to my parents as them being immigrants from East Africa. They came in during the Reagan administration, 1981, Pierre Trudeau here in Canada, Justin's father. Um, th there were there were these sort of sense of uh, conservative values being brought from like back home, yep. rather they be conservative in the idea of like a, a, a faith base. So like my parents, for example, from a Muslim background, yep. but at the same time, the idea the values of hard work and the ideas of like, um, like getting off your butt and basically working and not relying on the state to take care of you because that's basically what they ran away from, right? The idea that this was being manufactured on a national scale. Um, do you see that this pendulum is shifting now with Gen Z? Do you see um, a sense of a rise of more, of less altruism and more kind of um, a push towards uh, this need to problem solve. I, I see I see more people of my generation, and particularly myself and Akhil, being motivated by people like Elon Musk, right? Like uh, trailblazing and moving and using the resources of actually the free market to hunt down like some smart people and put people who are smarter than you together in a room to solve some of the world's biggest problems. And I see this trend rising, whether it not be from the millennials, but the Gen Zers themselves who are leaving the university now or who are starting creating startups and projects that we are in our, like our first year, second year. I see the I see this rising. Do you see maybe a pendulum shift back in the direction of uh, I mean, looking at things from first principles and saying, okay, let's apply like rationality and think from first principles. Stop thinking with emotion. Think with first principles. I mean, you guys would know this better than I would. So I don't know, right? I mean, you you're Gen Z, so you're right in the midst of it. So um, I I'm a little skeptical because what I see among Gen Z is, at least some Gen Z is at least, is a rise in individuality in the sense of a perverse individuality focused on emotion rather than on reason. Um, now it could be that both are out there. It could be that there is the, the kids who go, the kids who are going into engineering and science and want to be entrepreneurs and want to be successful are the ones that are more motivated about changing the world through markets and through science and through engineering and through the use of the mind and through reason. And there are others who are, who are more of the nihilists and the hedonists and, and, and who are, you know, motivated really by 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 sheer emotion. It, it's really hard to tell what the numbers are and, and where your generation falls in terms of what's the dominant. I don't know. I hope you're right. Um, I hope we have an influence. It you know this is why you know I love doing interviews with with young people. Is I hope to get to your audience. Your audience is the future, and I think the younger you're exposed to these ideas, to these ideas of in, uh, individualism. But really rational egoism, a morality, a morality, not a do whatever the hell you feel like, but a morality that says to be successful in life, not just in business, in life. These are the principles you have to follow. The younger you get exposed to that, the younger you start applying these ideas, the better. So I, I hope there are a lot of people out there open to these ideas and, 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 and open to the ideas of changing the world through markets and entrepreneurship and so on. I guess we'll see where Gen Z ultimately lands up, uh, it, you know, in, in this trajectory. It also changes as you grow older uh, in, in terms of in terms of people's attitudes. But let's hope that this is a generation that brings back a respect for individualism and capitalism. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think you uh, just want to quickly mention uh, something. Uh, maybe um, this could be, as you mentioned, maybe from my bias or just my narrow kind of field of influence. Um, do you think as the years went by, as the decades went by, there was a sense of, I, I think you've talked about this prior, which is the idea of like instant gratification mm -hmm. as being the, the sole source. I can I can think back to, I bring up counterculture for this very reason, because uh, there was this idea that um, all of a sudden with the collapse of the church and the importance of that in the family, um, sex as a, as a subject was transactional at this point as a bodily function, right? And as with yep. the contraceptive pill being introduced. And so it wasn't a worry anymore of shotgun marriages. It was more like, it's just a transaction. Um, over time, with the rise of technology and smartphones and uh, sort of this need for instant gratification to satisfy a dopamine level, um, 
do you see, I, I think more and more people are bringing their attention to the fact that the, the modern day like social media scene could be the equivalent of our, to our generation. And maybe the counter balance, the counter act comes from what we're seeing now with people recognizing the problems with social media. Do you think maybe that could be the forefront? Uh, do you see anything happening within that region? It, it could be, but at the end of the day, and I think, you know, Jordan Peterson's success with, with Gen Z's is to a large extent kind of the backlash against the instant gratification, the emotionalism of the culture. But the problem is Jordan Peterson doesn't offer solutions. He offers identification of a lot of problems. His solutions are the conservative solutions, the solutions that failed for previous generations and it doesn't take you anywhere. The solutions are religion, which I think is a dead end as a solution. Um, so, I, I, and, and yeah, I think people are coming to the realization of social media and being obsessed and being online all the time and all of that is probably damaging, although hard to tell uh, coming out of COVID how people are going to respond because they've yeah. now lived on social media and on Zoom and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. whether people will go start going out again will be interesting. I hope so. Um, but the flip side of that is, as I said earlier, individual lives and history shaped by ideas, by philosophy. Unless people are willing to embrace a new set of ideas, unless they're willing not just identify the problems, but go out and seek idea, ideas as solutions, ideas as ways of living, and ideas that are consistent with, uh, you know, so for example, sex, take sex. So I'm opposed to the conservative view of sex, probably even to Jordan Peterson's view of sex. I'm, I think it's immoral to wait until you're married to have sex. I think that's immoral. I, I, I think you should experience it beforehand. Otherwise, you'll be a bad husband and a bad wife. And, and you want to have sex with the person you're going to marry before you marry them, before you commit, because you want to make sure it's good, because it's an important part of marriage. But I'm also against sleeping with anybody, anytime, just, you know, a series of one night stands, whenever. So sex has this important, crucial spiritual value, but it's also not this... Um, um, a mystical uh, prohibited thing that, that, that needs to be shunned and, and you can't talk about it. it should be in the closet and you can only do it when you're married, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, can people find that right balance between the two? I worry that they go from have sex with anybody to the conservative view, the, the religious view of sex. And I worry that they do that on a lot of topics. And what I'd like them to do is discover a new path, a path that looks at all these things from a rational perspective and from a self-interested perspective. The fact that sex is so enjoyable should give you a hint that it's good and shouldn't be saved up for some, you know, special event. It's, it's good. (laughs) So do it right Uh, again, but it's so good that it has a spiritual element. You can't do it with anybody. Otherwise it loses its meaning. Mm -hmm. And that perspective, that egoistic perspective, that pro-pleasure perspective of pleasure in the context of a life, not in the context of a moment, is what it, your generation really needs. And again, I think they find that in Ayn Rand. Mm-hmm. And you'll, you'll find, for example, that Ayn Rand was a pathbreaker with regard to sex in her novels. Mm-hmm. Not only with regard to the act of sex, but, but, but uh, Atlas Shrugged, the, hero, the heroine of Atlas Shrugged, is a woman who is running a railroad in 1957 who broke the glass ceiling way ahead of her time, right? So, you know, I think people will find a lot of real values in Ayn Rand that can really help shape exactly this, this, this rejection of the counterculture, the, 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 the nihilistic, nihilistic left, and the, and the hedonistic left, mm-hmm. but also the conservatism of the right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, it's great that you brought up that because it segues into another question I had. I know there's a controversial sort of rape scene in The Fountainhead, and I wanted to talk about Ayn Rand's uh, relationship between women and positions of power, whether they'd be elected or in society. I mean, sure. I mean, Ayn Rand, I think, believed that women were capable of doing anything, Mm -hmm. that uh, they could do anything, that they had the capacity to do anything. I mean, again, her heroine is running a railroad and clearly the most competent person and giving orders, and she's the boss. Um, But Ayn Rand has this controversial essay that she wrote about the fact that she would never support a woman being president. Um, And she has a controversial view of what femininity in its essence mean and what masculinity in essence mean. 
Her view is that masculinity in its essence is an orientation towards nature and reality and solving the existential problem that nature presents to human beings. It's much more material and physical because reason is involved, but it's dealing with the world out there. Mm -hmm. And that the essence of femininity is what she called hero worship. It's, it's uh, idealizing the male. It's idealizing the hero, mm -hmm. right? And so it's oriented towards the male, not ignoring reality. You're still coping with reality. And of course, she ran a railroad, right? Dealing with reality. But that the essence of the feminine within you, that part that is the feminine, is oriented towards the male, mm -hmm. right? And if you think psychologically about how men behave and how women behave, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Now, I'm not a psychologist. I think that's not philosophy. I think that's psychology. Yes. And I'm not an expert on this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, it, and it's not a formal part of objectivism because it's more of a psychological identification. But I think if you look around and you look how men behave and how women behave, this has some explanatory power over that. Um, so she thought, she thought very highly of the position of president of the United States. Maybe if she'd lived through the last 12 or so years, <laughs> He wouldn't have such a high opinion of the president of the United States. But the, the idea that the president of the United States is this pinnacle, that there's nobody that a president can look up to. It is a heroic figure, in a sense. And she said a woman wouldn't want to be in that position because she wouldn't want to be in a position where there was nobody to look up to. Right. Um, so that's psychologically. A woman, a, a woman who is feminine, fully feminine, if you will, would not want to put herself in that position. And that's why she objected. But it's not a matter of capacity. It's not a matter of brain power. It's not about a matter of be, being able to be a boss. So even in Atlas Shrugged, the heroine of, 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 of Atlas Shrugged, the woman who runs the railroad, still has somebody she looks up to. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really important psychologically in the end, in the novel, and, and, and in how the story unwinds. But I'm going to try not to give away any spoilers. <laughs> uh, last question. I know you mentioned uh, briefly in the previous uh, segment that um, cer you certainly would not suggest the, I the failed ideas of the conservative right or the right wing, particularly in America and such, certainly here in the West. Um, what is your critique of the modern day right? And by modern day, let me let me clarify. Um, I, I'm so we, we as I mentioned subscribe to the idea of like suit like individual rights, and so I know you've uh, I, I I would say I'm a libertarian by if I had to choose a label. Yep. Um, and in terms of the conservative uh, right wing, my problem with like something like the neocon movement in the 2000s was this, these regime change wars in the Middle East, right? This idea of spending trillions of dollars of taxpayer money, so hardworking individuals who sure. already have a massive sized government, and this government's increasing ever so in the right direction, in, and from the, all of a sudden the right wing, not the left wing, who, or the Patriot Act and, and the war on terror to kind of increase government outreach into individuals' lives. It, what is your critique on that? Because often you'll hear right wing people talk about the fact that, oh, the left wing just does statism. What is your critique of the of the right wing when they do stuff like the regime change wars? And what would an ob objectivist point of view be when it comes to like, the libertarian or the conservative kind of region of that? So uh, objectivists are not conservative and are not, not libertarian. Uh, not libertarian. And libertarianism, it's such a big umbrella that I don't think it means that much to say I'm a libertarian. What do you actually mean? What do you actually stand for? Some libertarians respect rights. Other people don't believe in individual rights. Some want a limited government. Some believe in anarchy. I mean, you have a whole pretty big spectrum of people. Uh, objectivism has a unique view on almost all these political issues, including on foreign policy. But I've got a, actually, I've got a book on uh, criticizing the neoconservatives. So certainly objectivism rejects neoconservative foreign policy. Primarily because neoconservative foreign policy involves sacrificing Americans for the sake of others, mm. right? If you think about the Iraq war, it was called Operation Iraqi Freedom. Freedom. Mm -hmm. Why should American kids die, never mind money, but die for Iraqi freedom? Mm -hmm. Iraqis should fight and yeah. die for Iraqi freedom, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, why should we spend the money? Why should we spend the lives, expend the lives to do it? And also, the neocons have a weird view of the fact that people want freedom. I, I think most people around the world don't want freedom. That's why they don't have it. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's true that freedom is in everybody's heart. Everybody really wants freedom. And most people don't want freedom. They want to be taken care of. They want to be told what to do. It goes back to 
having somebody tell you what mm-hmm. truth is and, and how to behave. Um, and, and I think the neoconservatives are anti-individualism and anti-individual rights. They're very much focused on what's good for America, what's good for the state, what's good for the collective. And this is a problem with all kinds of conservatives. What are they trying to conserve? I'm a revolutionary. I'm not trying to conserve anything. I want to change everything. I want a new system. And now I think the founding fathers of America were not conservatives. The conservatives want to own them, but they weren't conservatives. They were revolutionaries. They created a completely new system of government, completely new than what had existed before them. So the problem with the conservatives is they don't know what they want to conserve. They uh, they are overly religious. They place too much value in religion, whereas I dismiss religion completely as a, as a system of values. And they are, for the most part, statists and, and collectivists. Some conservatives are better in the sense that they are less statist and less collectivist, and they see some value in individuals and individual rights. Others are not. Neoconservatives are not individualists. They're statists. Uh, But so are the paleoconservatives, so are the Trumpists, so are all of these, right? Unfortunately, the modern conservative movement, the the slice within it that is individualist, even in a broad definition of individualism, is tiny. Most of conservatives today is is nationalist, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, statist and collectivist. And you saw that with Trump. And, uh, that brings our question prompts to the end. Thank you so much for those answers. But before we wrap things up, uh, we just wanted to move on to a recurring segment on our show where we ask our guests to give us their three takeaways. These three takeaways can be from anything said on the podcast or any advice you want to give our Gen Z listeners as they enter the new world. So with that being said, what are your three takeaways? Well, one would be read on your end. I mean, uh, you're right. A lot of Gen Zs don't know who she is and don't know anything about her. Pick up the novels. And I know reading is not something Gen Z's do a lot of, particularly not fiction, Mm -hmm. but don't miss out on fiction. Fiction is like life-changing. It's so amazing to live in that universe. And and reading is different than movies and different than binge watching a TV series. It requires more of you, but the rewards are much, much higher. So one is read Ayn Rand. Second is, you know, live, take your life seriously. Um, and don't wait to live. Don't wait. Oh, one day I'll take my life seriously. No, you know, take your life seriously. And that doesn't mean, you know, be overly serious and, you know, yeah. not having fun. It means living. It means doing the things that are going to promote your happiness the best. And that involves having fun sometimes, studying hard, working hard, you know, finding great relationships. It involves, you know, uh, both the hard work and the pleasure that it, a full life involves. Uh, and then finally, if you value your own life, then you should value freedom and liberty and, and get involved and, and f- because it's your future. And, and these politicians in Alberta and in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, you know, wherever they happen to be in Washington, D.C., they shape, they have a, a, too much influence on our lives. And uh, if you want to live a happy, successful, long life, Reining them in is a high priority. So, so get involved. Find ways in which to help change the world in which we live. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for talking to us today. Yeah, Sure, my pleasure. Took, Thanks yeah, for having me. It took us a while to get this set up. Uh, I will say that I am now a owner of a copy of The Fountainhead. So I'm definitely <laughs> going to get right on there reading that one. Uh, it was truly a humbling experience. So thank you for being one of our first high-profile guests. And we were very humbled that you took the time out of your busy schedule. I know this was hard for you to move between California and Puerto Rico and stuff like that. So thank you so much. No problem. I will will say this, that uh, objectivism views humility as a vice. Okay. (laughs) Pride as a virtue. You should say uh, we're very proud to have had you on. Yes. We're very proud proud to have had your own on. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck on all your endeavors. All the best and success with this podcast. So thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And Bye. thanks everyone for watching. Uh, we'll see you next week.